All right, good evening. Good evening. As you're coming on, please remember to share. Remember to share on your page. Remember to share on your page. We're excited about having you on today. Happy Thanksgiving weekend. Happy Sunday. Please share on your page. We're going to pray in about 30 seconds. So you got about 30 seconds to grab your Bible and grab your pen and grab your notebook and be ready to join us. It's Sunday evening. We're so glad to have you on. So glad to have you on. All right, all right. Please make sure you share it. Hello, everyone. Glad to have you on. We're so excited about tonight as we continue this expectation series. Again, share it on your page. We will be praying in about 15 seconds. So please just uh, share it on your page and get your notebooks and pen and paper and your Bibles ready. All right, let's pray. God, we thank you for this day. We praise you and celebrate you for another opportunity to study your word, another opportunity to learn your expectation for us. God, we thank you for how you've kept us, how you've delivered us, how you've helped us, how you've aided us, how you've been there for us, how you've made ways for us. God, we thank you even for more than that, just for waking us up, just for allowing us to be in our right mind. And God, as we study your word, we ask that you inhabit this lesson and bring out the nuggets that will help assist us in being better equipped to serve you in the way you created us to serve. So God, we celebrate you in advance. It's all about you. In your son Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Listen, we're so excited about tonight as we continue in this expectation series. Um, please, uh, God, you are a healer for those that are in need of healing. God, we know that you are already working on it right now, mm -hmm. right now, right now. So listen, <laughs> listen, um, we're gonna get started uh, with Dr. Karen and the selection and then we're going to move right into the study. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to be my blessing. Amen. Amen. How many of you know that it's not until you surrender all to him and truly allow him to be Lord of your life that truly you can say you are his and living according to his will for you. So tonight, as we've been in this November study of expectation, God, God led me to something strange, but so exciting as I unpacked it. Coming from the book of Luke, chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, and, and really we're going to go through the whole chapter. In fact, I believe that God is going to lead me to a series in 2019 dealing with this chapter, but I, I just want to hit the whole chapter, but I want to focus on just one verse. Luke chapter 15, verse number 20 says this. Now we're going to look at the whole verse, the whole chapter, but I just want to look at verse number 20, verse number 20 says this, 
It says, and he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great ways off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran, ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. He arose, decided to come home. And when he was far off, his father saw him, had compassion, ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Tonight, I wanna to deal with the thought in this expectation series, the expectation for dealing with the estranged, the expectation for dealing with the estranged. Estranged by terminology is a person that is no longer close or affectionate to someone. They're alienated. Or it's a person that's no longer living with a spouse. Now we're in Thanksgiving season and the reality is all of us have people that we aren't talking to anymore. All of us have people that we have alienated or we have written off or we have stopped speaking to. And the reality is God has an expectation for the way we deal even with people that we thought were no longer necessary in our lives, that we thought were no longer needed. People that once were family, once were close, once we had a relationship with, but now all of a sudden we don't speak anymore. All of a sudden we don't deal. Now we used to love them, but now all of a sudden they are no longer necessary in our lives based on our opinion. But, but God still has an expectation for the way we deal with them, with them. This, this is a great narrative that comes about in three parables. And these P three parables are started by Jesus in response to how the Pharisees are dealing with him. So Luke chapter 15, verse one says, the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Now they're talking about Jesus and how he's dealing with the tax collectors and the sinners, but they don't realize that these are the people he was sent to. In fact, he says in the earlier text that those who are well don't need me. I came to the sick. But the reality is they're his family. The tax collectors and the sinners are his family. And he is expressing to the Pharisees, which represents the traditional church, that there is a need you should have in dealing with those who have become estranged, those who have separated or been alienated for whatever reason. So, so, so he says, listen, let me give you some parables which I use to give my expectations of how you, the church, should deal with the extremes. So, so again, he's talking to the Pharisees. The Pharisees represent the established church. And he says, listen, this is how you should deal with them. Here's the first thing. I expect you to find those who get lost by their own preoccupation. I expect you to find those who get lost by their own preoccupation. How does he do this? He gives a parable about a lost sheep. He says there's a shepherd who has a flock of a hundred and realizes that one of his sheep is missing. And he leaves the 99 to go after the one. Watch this, he has a flock. Now sheep, they eat and they get so consumed with what they're eating that they tend to wander off while tracing the food. So they wander off and this sheep has wandered off because they've been preoccupied with what's in front of them. But he leaves the 99 that he has together and goes after the one. God expects us, regardless of how they got separated, regardless of what preoccupied. And many of us get mad at people who get preoccupied by becoming successful who get preoccupied by finding a new boo, who get preoccupied just by the ups and downs of life. We figure, oh, they ain't called me yet. They ain't called me in a while, so I'm gonna forget about them. No, he says, you go find them. Now, here's the thing that you miss if you just read it in your natural understanding. You miss that you, it doesn't say how far he went. 
doesn't say how long he traveled, doesn't say what he had to go through, what rivers he had to swim through, what mountains he had to climb over. It says that he chased them down until he retrieved them. Then watch this. He picked them up and put them on his shoulder and returned with them, which means he didn't allow the chance to take place that he would misplace them again. So instead of letting them wander in front of him, he picked them up and put them. He took extreme links to ensure that the relationship would be salvaged. Why? Because he valued the sheep so much and understood that preoccupation happens to anybody. He, he, here's the reality that we don't want to admit. The only reason that the sheep got away is because somehow the shepherd himself was preoccupied. Oh, wow. So the shepherd got preoccupied with shepherding the 99. The sheep got preoccupied with whatever led him away. But, rea but the reality is both of them got preoccupied. You, you know, that, that's like somebody uh, calls you and they, you say, well, I ain't hear from you in a long time. And they say, oh, well, the phone works two ways. Why? Because the reality is someone can only become separated if both parties take a pause from being interactive. <laughs> Right, so so he expects us to find those who get lost by their own preoccupation. You you need to know, you need to know that there is an expectation for you to find those who have gotten lost because they've been preoccupied. You know, so here's the second thing. Then you got to focus on those who become lost due to our own personal overlooking. So we had to find those. We had to focus on those. So we were first commissioned and expected to find those who got lost because of their own preoccupation. Now we got to focus on those who get lost because of our personal overlooking. The next story he tells is of a coin. This woman who has 10 coins in the house and she misplaces one coin. The text says she cleans the house, turns the house upside down to find that one coin. But here's something we often miss. We say it's the lost coin, but the reality is it's not lost, it's overlooked. She knows where the coin is. It's somewhere in her house. It's not outside the house. It's somewhere within the confines. So she knows the parameters where the coin is. Um, it's not on the staircase outside. It's not in the drain. It's in the house. So it's not lost. It just simply means that somehow she has overlooked it. Ah, So many times we don't value what we have and we begin overlooking it. Friendships in the house, in our circle, we focus on one or two of them and fail to look at the value of the other ones and they feel lost, but they're right there in the parameters. Um, I, I, like yesterday, I had a fit because I was trying to find my flash drive, trying to find my flash drive that has my dissertation on it. Finding my flash drive, looking all over, getting frantic, but it was in the house. It was in the house. I just happened to overlook it. God says there are some people in your circle that that haven't disconnected from you that haven't erased their phone number out of your out of their their phone number out of your context have not unfriended you they're still there but for whatever reason you've been overlooking them and the reality is their value is necessary in the season you're in oh wow see she wouldn't stop even though she had nine coins she wouldn't stop until she found that tenth coin because whatever she needed to complete with the purchase could not be completed unless she had all 10. And you need to know there are some people in your life that will push you to the next level if you would just take the time to stop overlooking them and find them. They're not far. They just need some attention. Hold on. Because the reality is it took that coin being lost for her to, to, to attend to some of her own personal affairs. Again, if the coin wasn't lost, she wouldn't have cleaned the house. 
if the coin wasn't lost, she wouldn't have swept in the corners. Sometimes, maybe God allows you to overlook people because there are some tasks that will be assigned that need to be completed and that won't be completed until you realize the necessity of those you've been overlooking for a long time. Mm. Here's the third thing. God expects us when dealing with the estranged to forgive those who become lost. No, to forgive those who make prideful outbursts against you. So he goes into this next parable. And this is probably the most familiar parable. We call it the parable of the prodigal son. It's really the parable of the lost sons, two sons who were lost. But, but it begins with this. A younger son asks his father for his inheritance. He asks his father for his inheritance and his father divides his inheritance between the two boys. Now, many scholars argue, but if you just listen to the language, if I'm asking you for what I wouldn't get until you died, and I'm asking for it while you're living, I'm literally saying, I hope or wish you would die. I'm saying that you are more beneficial to me dead than you are alive. Give me what you're gonna give me now because I can't wait till the physical process of your death occurs. I wanna just act like you're dead and go ahead and get what you have for me. That's a prideful outburst. This, 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 this young boy, said, listen, dad, I've gained all I can gain from your materially being here. So I want to uh, jump ahead of the process of you dying just to get what you have for me. And many of us have had people make prideful outbursts toward us. They've, they've told us that what we have has no value to them. They've told us, they've, they come, they snap that back against us. They, they, they've cussed us out, but we're still supposed to forgive them. I don't care what they did to cause you to not speak to them anymore. I don't care what they did to cause you to disconnect yourself from them. God expects you to forgive them. He expects you to forgive them. I know they hurt your feelings. I know they might have done it publicly. I know the whole town is talking about what they did. But the reality is, God still expects you to forgive them. Hey, that's rough because our flesh says, I'll just live without them. My flesh says, I will learn how to live without them. I'll carry on my day. I will forget to mention their name. I can function where I won't ask them for no money. I won't ask them for no sugar. I'll be cool. But God expects us to forgive them. Mm. They spoke against you, but forgive them. They talked about you, but forgive them. They're benefiting off of what you had when they no longer needed you, but forgive them. Mm. That's the expectation of God, because you're not going to function well if you operate in unforgiveness. I know they hurt you, but forgive them. I know you feel bad, but forgive them. Here's the third, the fourth one. This is serious. God expects you to be fixated on a peaceful opportunity to reconnect. God, God expects you to be fixated on a peaceful opportunity to reconnect. The text says the boy had his issues while he was out. And one day he came home. The text says while he was afar off, the father saw him and had compassion. Watch this. He's walking from afar off. The father saw him before he saw the father. And the father use that opportunity to peacefully reconnect. The father had compassion and ran to him. God expects you to stop avoiding people who've hurt you, to stop running from them and blocking them. 
God expects you to wait for the right moment and reconcile yourself to them. Listen, I know they hurt you. And I know you can drive yourself insane staring in the mirror, practicing this conversation where you, where you cuss them out or get them back for how they hurt you. But God says no. Instead, focus that energy, fixate that energy on thinking of how to reconnect. He stood on his porch. You don't know how many days the boy was gone, it doesn't say. But a season had changed. But this father still came out on the porch hoping that his boy would come home. Not filled with anger, not filled with malice. He ran to him. Oh, man. He, he ran to him. And in running to him, he uh, had an opportunity to peacefully reconnect with his son. Oh, man. That there's some of us who need to adjust our attitudes when we think about those we've hurt or those who've hurt us. And we need to think about ways. We've seen them in the store. I know, I know why you're in the store. You try to go to the other aisle. But why not just approach them? Say you're sorry and mend the relationship. Hey, here's the next thing. God, God expects us when dealing with the estranged to be faithful in protecting them from others. Uh, th this is serious because the father comes, runs, falls on his neck, the text says, and kisses him. Now, we think that's all about just being so excited to see the boy. But if you go to the Old Testament, you understand in Deuteronomy chapter 21 that the boy's should have been stoned by the elders for the way he handled his father. So the father says, listen, I know you did me wrong, but I am obligated as your father to still protect you from the others. Your issue is with me. And I'm not going to leave you out there to be mishandled by them. Ooh, we. Um, um. So when there is a breach in relationship, here's the thing. You, you don't let nobody else talk about the problem. You don't let nobody in the street talk about. You, you don't let nobody else in the street throw daggers at the person. No, your job is to protect them. You, you must be faithful in covering them. Hold on, watch this. Even when it means you got to take some blows. That's serious. Because the elders were throwing stones. So to protect his son, he covered his son with his own body. And many of us, when we've been hurt, we take that time to join in with the crowd who's talking about the person who hurt us. But God expects us, oh man, that's rough. God expects us to still protect them, even when they hurt us. Woo! God expects us to cover them, even when they hurt us, to cover them even when it would be easier to join in the conversation of the crowd. God expects us to cover them. Mm. Mm. Here's the next thing. God expects us when dealing with the estranged to face them without pressing them to own up to their mistakes. Ugh. The father hugs them. He hugs him, he kisses his neck, but he never says, I told you you'd be back. He never says, I was waiting on you to be back. He never says, what brought you back? No, he simply loves on the boy. The boy makes it in, up in his mind to have this conversation with us. The father never prompts the conversation. Watch this. The father never prompts the boy to own up to his mistakes. The father simply loves them for coming back, protects them from the crowd who set to kill him, and the boy owns up. Stop trying to make people admit to what they did to you. They know. They, they, they're conscious of it. You don't have to make them say it. All you need to do is love on them. And if their conscience eats them up, they will confess. Look at what the boy says. The boy says, listen, I don't deserve to be a son. Just make me a servant. I, I don't even deserve. In fact, he started that conversation in the pig pen. 
he started talking himself up to how he would come back. So, so here's the reality. You don't have to cause him to hurt. He's been hurting since he's been in the pig pen. Oh, man. He's been beating up himself with his, his conscience has been beating him up the whole way back to the house. He's been rehearsing in him, his mind what he was going to say, how his father was going to respond. What if his father didn't respond right? What if his father wasn't home? What if the crowd got to him first? He's been, that's sometimes the only punishment that's necessary. Sometimes the only punishment that's necessary is the conviction you get in your own conscious when you realize you messed up. So the father doesn't press it. The boy owns up to it on his own. Here's the next thing. I got to hurry to the end. I'm almost done. When, when you're, when you're, you're, God's expectation for the way we deal with the estranged is this. He expects us to flip the script and provide the opposite of what they expect. So, so the, fa- the boy comes and says, listen, I don't, I'm not, I don't deserve to be a son. Make me a servant. I, I don't deserve to be called your son. Make me a servant. I don't deserve to be called. I don't worry about it, daddy. I'll punish myself. I, I will remove the labeling of being your son. And I will settle for just being a servant. That that was the boy's expectation. But the father flipped the script and provided for him the opposite of what he thought. The father says, listen, get him the best robe. Put a ring on his finger, put sandals on his feet, and let's throw a party. (laughs) God expects us. When we're faced with the opportunity to mend a relationship with someone who's estranged, he expects us to flip the script. He he expects us to provide the opposite of what they expect. Here's the reality. When I'm trying to mend a relationship, they're already expecting the worst. They're already tense and prepared to snap back, prepared to cuss back, prepared to fight if necessary. God expects us to flip the script. He expects us to provide the opposite of what they're expecting. You love them when they're expecting hate. You're kind to them when they're expecting nastiness. That's the air mark of what God expects. Oh man, listen, listen, here's the next thing. God expects us to fellowship with them in such a way that the pessimists become optimists, optimistic. God, God expects us to fellowship with them in such a way that all the pessimists become optimistic. Listen, it's right there in the text. The text says he called a servant to get the robe, the ring, the shoes, and to kill a calf so that they could eat and be merry. For his son was dead and alive again. He's lost and found, verse 24, and they began to be merry. Watch this. Remember, this was a public display of a prideful outcry, outburst. So everybody knew that the son was gone. Everybody knew that he disowned his father, took the money and ran. Everybody knew and nobody expected him to come back. So there was a house full of pessimists, a house full of negative people. But the father, when the son got back, welcomed him in such a way that those pessimists became optimistic. God expects us to fellowship with the estranged in such a way that everybody who was a naysayer, everybody that was a doubter, everybody that said he wasn't going to come back, he wasn't going to be nothing, he never changed, he never be transformed, can now see God's transformation power. That, That they can be joyful simply because they watched how God worked in somebody else's life, which means you can't keep it to yourself. When when the estranged relationship gets healed, you can't act like they're not a part of your life anymore. You can't act like everything's the same. No, you ain't talked to Sister Susie in 13 months. Now you're speaking, you need to celebrate it. You need to talk about it so that other people can know that relationships can be healed. Mm. 
But here's the real talk. Number nine, the expectation of dealing with the estranged, God expects us to factor in the people that will be outdone, that'll be angry. Because here's what happened. The party was going on, but remember there was another brother in the house. He was in the back. He heard the party. And when he found out what was happening, the text says he wasn't happy. The text says, uh, when he found out, he says, he got angry. Verse 28 says, he wouldn't even go into the party. So his father came out to him and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I've been serving you, never transgressed your commandment, yet you never gave me a young goat that I could make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who devoured your heart livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf. So he's bitter. And here's the reality. Anytime an estranged relationship is healed, other people are going to be mad. The people that remained your friend. Oh, man. Oh, let's deal with this. God, I don't want to got. Well, we'll go a little bit over. Um, the people that stayed. See, the reality is there probably were some other people that were angry, but they hung with you while the other friend left. Yet when the other friend left, you get on Facebook and you get all excited about the fact y'all ain't party together in two years. Don't worry, the friends that's been around you, that's been dealing with you, that's been hearing you talk about that person, they gonna think you fake. Cause you done talked about them for two years and now you partying with them. But the reality is you gotta already know everybody ain't gonna be happy. Oh, ah, the people that's been blowing up your inbox when they found you and your boo split up. And now you and your boo back together, oh, they mad. They mad because they thought they had a chance. You got to already take into account, factor in that everybody's not going to be happy. The reality is you're not doing it for them. You're doing it because it's the expectation of God that you heal what needs to be healed. They're not going to be happy. This boy was irate. In fact, he no longer called him his brother. He simply called him his father's son. You got to understand, everybody's not going to be happy. <laughs> we speak from experience. Everybody not going to be happy. When things go back to normal, they're not going to be happy. But you got to factor it in. But here, here's the last thing. Here's the last thing. How do you deal with the estranged? Here's the last thing. You got to be fixed on the big picture. And that's your obligation to restore. Here's what the father didn't do. The father didn't get into a back and forth with his son. He simply said this, verse 32, it was right that we should make merry and be glad for your brother was dead and is alive again, was lost and is fine. See, here's what you can't do when you're trying to heal these estranged relationships. You can't fall into the trap of getting into a discussion or a back and forth with those people who aren't happy about the relationship healing. You, you can't find yourself trying to justify what you're doing to people who will never understand because they got their own messed up relationships that they won't fix. The reality is you can't worry about them. You got to focus on the obligation God has, and that's for you to restore. So what they don't like it? So what they're not happy? The text never says the brother went back into the party. The text never says he ever hugged his brother and welcomed him back. But the story ends with the father justifying his actions, being solidified and fixed on his obligation to restore. His priority, your priority in this is to restore the relationship. If the world don't understand, it don't matter. God knows and God understands. Hmm. God expects us. It's Thanksgiving time. There were some people that you look at the, 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 the year flashback on Facebook, who you was hanging around with last year, that for whatever reason you've fallen out with and you weren't with this year. There are some people that you haven't spoken to in a while and you've made up in your mind that you're cool not speaking to them. Mm -mm. God expects us when we deal with those who are estranged, those who were once in fellowship, once in relationship and are no longer in relationship. God expects us as followers of him to follow his expectation. And that's to go after them 
no matter how long it takes to look for them and stop overlooking them and to forgive them or ask for forgiveness ourselves because the reality is one act on one person's side does not sever the relationship the relationship does not become severed until both parties have agreed not to go after each other so so here, here, here here's as we close there's another relationship that many of us have severed that has become estranged and that's our relationship with christ christ hasn't moved he's still waiting for us but somehow we have strayed away and he's here right now and he's ready to extend an invitation for you to come back home there's nothing you've done no party you've been to no drink you've drunk no cigarette you smoked no weed you rolled no powder you sniffed no pills you've popped no act you've done that can separate you from the love of christ mm -hmm. that that you've not done anything that's so bad that god is not willing to receive you back and forgive you of your sins so so here, here here's the connection time we first want to extend the invitation for you to connect to christ if you've never experienced the love of christ in such a way that it caused you to submit to him to confess him as your lord and savior and you hear god telling you right now wherever you are that it's time it's time for him to be more than just someone you cry out to in your problems but it should be someone that you surrender to and submit to in your life if that's your call if you feel god urging you to confess him as lord and savior and you're ready to connect to him simply inbox us so we can pray here's the second thing if you've been connected to him in the past but you've somehow disconnected you stop worshiping stop praying stop talking to him stop believing in him stop following his rules stop walking in his way and in his will but you hear god saying today it's time to come home if you found yourself in a pig pen experience like the young man from the text and you feel that god is telling you it's time to come home then inbox us so you can reconnect to christ and we'll pray with you finally if you want to connect to us to the life center if you want to connect and connect to dr karen and myself um, in relationship then then simply go to our website www.tlcsumter.org hit the connect tab and give us your inbox your email address so we can reach out to you and you can begin this fellowship we are a community you're 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 there we're a community of christ followers this is not a church by what many of us have called church this is a community we fellowship together we do life together we walk through life together so again and finally if you want to connect through contribution you can use givelify cash app or paypal using the tag tlc sumter listen today I'm, I'm asking for something special i'm asking for contributions to the bread of heaven food ministry which is the breakfast ministry of mount pisgah they feed breakfast seven days a week and we have committed to support them in the purchase of breakfast meats in the purchase of grits in the purchase of plates, napkins, cutlery, and coffee. So grits, breakfast meat, plates, napkins, cutlery, and coffee. So if you want to donate, make a contribution to that, hit us up on Givelify, Cash App, and earmark it for Bread of Heaven. All those donations will be given to Ms. Gwen China this week and in the weeks to come. That is our outreach for the rest of the year, we are giving toward the breakfast menu. In fact, we're gonna be going there a couple of days that we'll announce next week to go serve breakfast and do devotion at the breakfast ministry uh, right there on Council Street. All right, listen, we thank you for being on. We are so excited. We're gonna close in prayer and uh, we're just going to ask, oh, listen, tomorrow is Cyber Monday. And we are advertising and launching a Cyber Monday, Monday deal for our Principles of Preaching class. It's a Cyber Monday deal. Look out for it. 
for those who want to learn or improve or perfect their preaching, man, we got a deal, a course for you. We got other stuff coming up too, but that's going to be launched tomorrow. Um, look for it. Let's pray. God, we thank you and celebrate you. God, we thank you for showing up. God, this was a difficult lesson mm -hmm. because we've often been taught to let people die in certain seasons and leave them alone. But there are some bitter relationships that need to be healed. There are some relationships where we left in an unhonorable manner. We left with an attitude. We ended it with strife. And God is saying, no, there's a better way to do it. Mm -hmm. And so, God, right now, give us the strength to act out the tidbits of this lesson. Give us the strength to, to be able to forgive, to find, and to focus. Give us the strength to be able to fix. Remember, our primary obligation is restoration. Mm -hmm. God, you forgave us. No matter how far we went away, no matter how much we felt overlooked, no matter how much we made uh, personal outbursts against you, you forgave us. Mm -hmm. And it's our expect your expectation of us that we mirror your behavior with the people in our lives. Give us the ability to do it. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. Listen, we thank y'all for being on. We love you. Thank you have you a great week. And we look forward to seeing you on Friday. Remember we announced it's not going to be Thursday this week. Y'all keep us in prayer. We got to go and defend mm -hmm. our dissertation proposal on Thursday. So I need you to be in prayer. No, she's my editor. So it's not just me. Uh, she's whooping my booty. But keep us in prayer. And then on Friday at 830, we're going to be on with a different life. I love you. Please share this. If it blessed you, please talk about it in the comments and encourage others to watch. Thank you, guys. Love you. Love you. Have a great night.